and gentlemen, my name is Judy Lin. Tonight, it is my honor to introduce you to a man who has played a huge part in my life. When I was seven years old, my parents left me and my three younger siblings with my grandparents. But not long after that, my grandparents passed away from TB. Suddenly, I was alone with three younger siblings depending on me. So I tried to sell vegetables at the market, so we had money for food. But I didn't realize that I had caught TB, TB too. Sorry. Thankfully, ICM staff found me and took me to their recovery shelter. For the past 12 years, my siblings and I had been cared for by ICM. And I am now studying to become a psychologist, majoring in special education. I want to help children who suffered from early traumas, and I want to help them overcome it by establishing a foundation for them and, and treat them for free. Last month, we had our white coating and pinning ceremony, which means we are now qualified for our internship program. Now I am one step closer to my dream. I owe this a lot to many of you here tonight. Thank you for dreaming with me. Tonight, tonight it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. David Sutherland has been a huge part in my life. I met David 12 years ago, and as a chairman of ICM's board, he has been coming to the Philippines ever since. For recent, uh, no. For most of that, he was a managing director of Morgan Stanley. Yeah, Stanley. <laughs> Sorry. It's quite cold here. And for more recently, he was a more director Morgan Stanley, chief financial officer in Asia Pacific. Two years ago, he left the business world to focus on ICM full time. So please welcome David Sutherland. <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm just glad she didn't say Goldman. <laughs> Listen, I got to say that uh, I really look forward to this evening every year. I get some of my best friends in the world all together. And uh, this evening we also have about 20 countries uh, signed on on the internet uh, live watching this, uh, this production. So, you know, it's just fantastic to be here. And my job is to try to help you connect with the people that ICM works with every day. But that's not an easy job because here we are in this great ballroom with, uh, you know, great experiences and we're, you know, bidding on prizes and, you know, we're all dressed up. And, and, uh, and uh, maybe you came from a stressful day at the office, and maybe there was a lot of, you know, problems with the kids at home or whatever. There's probably a hundred things on your mind right now, and as you walked in, probably ICM wasn't one of them. But this evening, my job was to try, is to, try to help you to grasp the life that, uh, that millions and millions of people go through when they live in ultra-poverty. What does that really mean? So let me ask you to do this. Tonight we're talking about dream with me. Can you just imagine with me a story? Imagine that you were born in a rural island surrounded by sugarcane fields. Imagine that your father is a farmer and you grow up with the rhythms of the field dictating the rhythms of your life. In seasons of plenty, your family has enough to get by but just barely enough. But in times of drought, in times of harvest seasons, then there's just no food. There's not enough to be around. You were the seventh daughter out of 12 children. And all of your older siblings have dropped out of elementary school. The uh, boys, they are working as farmers, and, and the uh, girls have all married and started having their own children. And when you're a child, you promise yourself that this will not happen to you, that you will do something different. And so every day, whether it's sunny, whether it's rainy, whether you've your family has enough money to feed you breakfast or not, you are, your determined little legs carry you off to school. And that determination pays off. 
you become the very first child in your entire family ever to graduate from elementary school. And on graduation day, your, your heart is brimming with pride and success, and you're thinking about all those aspirations. But not long after that, then one of your brothers gets ill, and he gets seriously ill. And as his condition works, and the, your parents, they have problems. They can't afford to take him to the doctor, but, but it gets worse and worse, and they have no choice. And so they, uh, they, they borrow some money to try to save his life. But it's too late, and he passes away anyway. And of course, your parents are crushed. And, uh, but not only are they crushed, now they are in debt as well because they had to buy a, borrow money for his coffin and they had to pay for his medical bills. And now in your family, there is no more money for food. In, they can hardly afford to feed you, so they can't afford to send you to school. And as you say goodbye to your brother, at the same time, you say goodbye to your dreams because suddenly you are a child no more. And from then on, you help your mother at home. You carry the heavy buckets of water. You take care of babies. You see your life stretch out before you with no end in sight. And then one day, you meet a boy, and his name is Levi. And you have a lot in common, and you fall in love. But nobody ever really told you how babies are made. And the next thing you know, you are uh, pregnant, and you're expecting a baby of your own. And to uh, survive, you have to work with your husband in the sugarcane fields, even then you're pregnant. And it's backbreaking work. And you become dangerously thin as a result. And your husband is scared that you're going to lose your baby. But miraculously, your baby is born and the baby is healthy and strong. But now it's up to the two of you who can hardly provide for yourselves to also provide for this little girl's life. And so you go back out into the field in the heat of the sun and you work more. Now, fast forward 20 years, and now you're, it's a storm, and you're woken up by the winds and the heavy rain. And six of you are sleeping in a tiny little room. Thankfully, there's no damage to your house from this storm, but because it rained yesterday, your husband couldn't work, and that, that means that there will be no breakfast for your family this morning. And your heart breaks as you, look to, as you tell your four children that they won't be able to go to school today because you have no money for transport again. And as your son looks into your eyes, you can see that he is losing hope. And you see in him that those desires, the, the desires that you had when you were a young child. And, but you know that really he just needs to grow up and he needs to understand that people like us, we can't dream like rich people can. And so as you walk out of your house feeling hopeless, then you meet your cousin. And she tells you about a meeting that she wants you to attend down at the little church down at the end of the road. And you're a little skeptical about attending, but the cousin says, there'll be food, and so you're in. And that is when I met a woman named Maria. And she joined ICM's Transform program earlier this year. And what I have told you is her actual life story. Now, that may sound uh, a little unusual, almost unbelievable, but her story is actually far, far too common. There are hundreds of thousands of ICM participants, and they all experience the same themes. They experience hunger, hard work, injustice, illness, lost hope, buried dreams. You know, Maria has eight children, and she loves every one of those eight children. Three of them are now married, and they're struggling financially with their own families. One of those kids dropped out of school, and now he works in the city. He sends a little money home when he can. And four of Maria's children remain at home. Her daughter named Mara Mar Mar is 18 years old. She has Down syndrome. Melvin, her second youngest, is a real character. He loves life. He loves to draw attention to himself. And her family has no electricity. They have no toilet. They live in this tiny house that's uh, made of bamboo and plastic sacks. They have to walk 10 minutes to get to the nearest water. And Maria's husband, Levi, he works in the sugarcane fields as a laborer. For half the year, he earns about 10 U.S. dollars per week. And the other half, he makes a lot less than that. Maria, she, she tries to make a living selling shrimp down at the local pier, but it's very unreliable. When you take this income of the family, all of those sources, and you divide it by the six people in their family, their average income is just 33 U.S. cents per person per day. They go to bed hungry several times every week as a standard practice. Now, is that story unusual? Believe it or not, Maria is actually richer 
than the average person, the ultra poor person that goes through ICM's program. Across the hundreds of thousands of people that go into our participation, the average daily income is only 28 cents per day. That is 15 percent poorer than Maria's family. Now, most ICM participants, they live in cramped homes. What does that mean? In Hong Kong, we think we have cramped homes. This is a photo of her entire house, and this is the people that, live, that sleep inside that house every night. Now, let me make that a little bit more vivid. If your home had 2,000 square feet of space and you had the density of the average ultra-poor family, you would have uh, 100 people living in your flat. Now, most of the ultra-poor, they don't purify their water. They live without electricity. A large percentage of them defecate outside. For Maria and for millions of the ultra-poor in the Philippines, this is a way of life. Now, how does that kind of life affect someone? Maria told me, my family has never had a reliable income. There are times when I just feel like giving up. Now, put yourself back in Maria's shoes, and, and you decide to accept your cousin's offer to attend that ICM meeting. You decide to sit at the back. You hope that the meeting won't last for too long. You're wondering where the food will come from. That's really all you're here for is for the food. And there's two people up front, and they are, uh, they seem, uh, they're now part, they tell you that, they're, that you are now part of the ICM Transform program, and ICM is an organization that tries to help poor people, and these people, they seem nice enough, but you think to yourself, how can they possibly change my life by just talking to us? And after 90 minutes of this meeting, you take these food packs and you make the long walk home. And then the next week, you, the ICM trainer in front, he calls Jimmy. He explains that he's going to give you some hands-on training on how to do business. He's going to demonstrate what they call business in a box. And this week, he's going to tell you how to make snacks. And you think to yourself, well, cooking snacks, selling them, that's, that's something that might work for me. And you're not very confident that you'll actually be able to sell these little cakes, but you get your friend from the community, and the two of you work together. And, and uh, pretty soon, you walk around, and you try to sell all your stuff, and you're surprised. You're amazed. You sell everything that you made. Now, the next morning after that happens, you're able to send Melvin off to, and all of his uh, brothers off to school with full bellies and with a packed lunch. And you're proud of your income and what it means for your children. The next week at Transform, they teach a different snack, this time banana chips, and, and you try that one again too, and, and again you sell out in your community. And as well as earning income, you're also learning so much from the Transform lessons about health, about saving money, about budgeting. And you begin to take to heart that thing that that pastor keeps telling you. You think to yourself, maybe I am here for a purpose. Maybe I am worth something. And as those weeks pass, you find yourself expectantly waiting now for those Friday afternoons when these meetings happen. And you've now tested several business in a box kits, and your income is way up, and you're able to feed your kids regularly, and see the, including Melvin. And you know that Melvin is now going to graduate from elementary school in a few months, and you're so proud to see him succeeding. And at the end of the ICM's four-month training program, there's a graduation ceremony. And to your surprise, they make you the first honors graduate. It is the only time you've ever graduated from anything in your life. And you proudly accept that medal, and you begin to dream again. Now, that is a terrific story, isn't it? The Deanna and I, we visited Maria in early April, and she and her husband Levi, they are doing really well. They are incredible people, heroes in every sense of the word. Maria and her family belong to a group of people we call the ultra-poor, that is, people who live on less than 50 U.S. cents a day. ICM's focus of our entire charity is only on people that earn less than 50 cents a day. And at ICM, we try to think like business people. We, we feel like we've spent a decade, exper a decade experimenting trying to uncover the most effective strategies. We've collected 50 million data points in order to help us design strategies to try to address this devastating reality. And after many years of trial and error, we have pioneered a four-month intensive training program that we call Transform. The local pastor and six members of the community, they invite 30 people from their, ultra-poor people from their community to these once-a-week training, and they train them in values, in health, and in livelihood. And as you've heard in Maria's story, each of these interactive lessons brings tangible change to them and their community. And we see amazing benefits after Transform. Based on those 50 million data points, the average ultra-poor person that goes through an ICM program experiences a 101% increase in their household income. 
They have 28% uh, fewer people have serious illness, 36% reduction in chronic hunger, and there are scores of other improvements. And when we do surveys three years after the conclusion of our programs, we show that most of these improvements, they continue. But here's the one thing you need to know. If you only remember one thing that I say tonight, this is it. If you want to address ultra-poverty, hope is the key. People living in extreme poverty, they ex experience extreme stress. In ICM communities, 32% of all mothers have had one of their own children die. That is one-third of all households. And, and in addition, one out of every 10 people say that they are seriously ill at any given moment. That, those combination of just those two facts puts enormous emotional strain on those family members. And that leads to fatalism. At ICM, after all this research, we have concluded that the underlying cause of poverty is rooted in fatalism. And that the antidote of fatalism is hope. Now, as you heard in Maria's story, she felt alone. She didn't think that anybody could help her. But the relationships that Maria made during Transform gave her the courage to start her business. Her friend helped her to sell her products. She was able to talk about her problems with her friends. Now, Maria is not alone. After Transform, our participants report an increase in the satisfaction of their families. And this factor, the regression analysis says, is the factor that drives all the other positive change. For example, our research shows that participants who improve their family relationships are more likely to guide their children out of malnutrition. And another ICM study shows that strong family relationships make a poor person more willing to be tested for tuberculosis. When people trust each other, they help each other, and lives are saved. You cannot underestimate the significance of hope. Now, if you come to that conclusion that hope is the answer, then, then how does one possibly bring hope to millions of people? How do you achieve scale? At ICM, we have discovered that there are small churches on every street corner in the Philippines. And most of these churches are run by very poor pastors who are passionate about helping other people. Before ICM ever arrives, the local pastor already knows the first name of every person in his village. And they, these people are incredibly motivated to work with us to help people that are in their village. We believe that it would be virtually impossible to replicate this church-based distribution system using secular means. At great cost, you could choose to hire expensive social workers to travel to poor families, but those people would not have the pre-existing interpersonal relationships in the community. ICM focuses its efforts on 1.7 million people. Those are the ultra-poor people, and they live in 17 provinces in the Philippines. This is a stunning number. In a few months, ICM will graduate its 750,000th person through our Transform program. That means that in our 17 provinces, we have now taken almost one-third of all of the ultra-poor people in the entire province through a four-month training program. That is astounding. Now, we feel good about all of our numbers, but then, you know, we're business people, right? And so, you know, you decide to invest in a fund, and the fund's doing really well. What do you want to know? What happened to the market? What happened to the index? Did they outperform the index? And in the same way, we want to think the same way about poverty. How do we measure, compare us to other, whatever the index is in poverty? Listen, if the, perhaps the most respected poverty reduction strategy in the world was grouped by an, birthed by an organization in Bangladesh called BRAC, that strategy is so successful it's being run in 27 countries, and the world is spending billions of dollars to try to use their strategy to take people out of poverty. There was a huge multi-year, multi-country study that was published in Science Magazine, six countries. It was just released a couple of months ago. And that study showed that the BRAC program works and it creates $350 of sustained income for each poor family. Now that news was such big news. Front page of the New York Times, LA, uh, LA Times, it was in The Economist, it was in every major publication, and most of the headlines was new effective strategy to figure it out. There is a solution for poverty. We figured it out. But this BRAC program requires several thousand dollars per family to implement. Now, when I was on this stage last year at this banquet, we told you that we were running a randomized control trial with Yale University to try to measure our effectiveness. And I told you last year that this year we would announce the results of that, uh, of that study. 
I'm a little frustrated because the statisticians haven't finally f finished it. They're still working on it. Statisticians seem to be able to look at numbers a lot of ways. They've only worked at it 99 ways. They still are trying to get the 100. So it's not 100% complete. But let me tell you the preliminary results that Yale has validated. This study involved 50,000 people. And it showed that an ICM family would earn $361 per year more if they did ICM's program than if they had not participated in Transform. Now, I just told you that the BRAC model said that the people earned $350 more. The regression analysis says our guys earned $361. That means that our impact on poverty is about the same as BRAC's. But our program, we incur only about $50 per family, a little over 50, and BRAC includes a, uh, incurs a few thousand. That means that ICM's programs is generating a 50x return on poverty reduction compared to the best in class secular poverty reduction program in the world. Wow. That's pretty good numbers, right? Listen, it is astonishing that ICM is able to deliver our program for $50 a family. People think that, you know, when I talk to secular people or to people in other countries, they say, it is not possible. How could you possibly do that? When we do it for $50 per family, when there's five people in the family, it works out to about 10, uh, there's, uh, the 10 U.S. dollars per family member. That's not $10 per month. That's not $10 per year. That is $10 period. That's all. Now, how can we keep those costs so low? Let me give you just one example. A few days ago, I asked our Philippine staff to send us photos of their journeys to help poor communities. These are actual photos taken of actual ICM staff getting to actual ICM communities. And these are real-time photos. They were all taken this week. There are no expensive Land Rovers here. Jimmy and Gemma, they traveled to Maria's community in a van just like this usually with five or eight people in that van. They did three hours there, three hours back on the same day, and they did that every week for four months. And every day, Jimmy and Gemma are on, in that van going to some other remote community. That is extraordinary commitment. These ICM trainers, they endure incredible hardships in order to help other people. And to, they want to stretch your donated dollars as many as long as possible. Now, in... Hong Kong, I have heard a rumor that some people seem to believe that ICM is a rich charity, that, uh, that we don't really need any kind of money. Let me tell you, that is not true. In the last few years, ICM has gotten larger, but we have no excess resources at all. One of the hallmarks of what, the way we run our program is that we don't leave any money on the table. We don't have some big bank account with a lot of extra cash in it. Historically, every dollar that you have donated to ICM has gone straight to the poor. Every single dollar, not sitting in a bank account. That means that we scale the number of communities we serve in direct proportion to the amount of donations that we receive. Last year, Nick and Jacqueline Norris, they made a donation, and their donation was the reason that we were able to go to Maria's uh, village. But these facts, these facts that first, our budget has no excess in it, so that it's not easy to cut our budget. And secondly, that we, don't, we operate without a cash buffer, that has meant running significant risks for our organizations. And this year, the donations didn't come in quite as quickly as we expected. And as a result, some of our ICM staff had to, uh, had to defer their salaries until later, until after this banquet. And we faced the real possibility of disrupted programs. We're much bigger. But it's, it, it has been stressful. It has been no fun at all. So that means that ICM's board has decided to try to be more prudent. And so that means the, the budget that we are operating in this year right now is actually smaller than the budget that we ran last year. Now, that is good news for ICM's financial health, but it means that we need to turn away some poor people that actually need help. And that, honestly, is a little emotionally exhausting. Now, thankfully, our randomized control trials that we were talking about has already led to our model starting to be approved by some large funding institutions. This month, ICM signed its first ever grant with USAID. Phenomenal thing in our world. <clears throat> it was the smallest grant that, uh, that USAID ever gave in the Philippines, but it's the first one and it gets our name on the board. Now, despite all of these ch uh, changes, ICM's core donor base is still all of you. It is the people in this room. You remain the most important people to our charity. We don't think of you as donors. We think of you as partners. 
And honestly, we need more partners in order to help millions of people because $10 goes a long ways to help, to help someone like Maria. Maria's business has continued to thrive after Transform. Her income has more than doubled to $3 a day. Her husband, Levi, is rebuilding their home. In fact, ICM is soon going to host a mission trip, a vision trip, to take a few people to go to Maria's house and help her and her husband rebuild their very house. I'm wondering whether a few of you might like to go along with me and help out on that, on that process. That'd be fun. Listen, I have to tell you that, that Maria's children have not missed a day of school since, the, since Transform finished. And these children now eat three meals a day. And more importantly, they eat, eat nutritious, healthy food. And I thought that you all might want to meet this woman with the infectious smile. So let me introduce you to Maria, who is right there. <laughs> Listen, um, Maria took a long trip in order to get here. Only a couple of days ago, she was in her, uh, in her own home, and then she traveled 45 minutes across some very, very isolated places to get to the big city of Escalante, which has a couple thousand people. And then she went a few hours on the road to Bacolod, a city of a half a million. She spent the night in Bacolod, and then she took her first plane ride to Manila, and then she connected to her first international flight to Hong Kong, driving, arriving late Tuesday. So... Would you welcome with me, Maria? Thank you for being here. And um, this is Carol, and Carol works for ICM. So I just thought I would ask Maria a couple of questions, and uh, Carol could translate for us. So um, Maria, can you tell us a little bit about how ICM has impacted your life? sang ICM sa nakatabang sa pag-usab sa akong kinabuhi. ICM has a great impact to me, and I learned so much from it that it changed my life. O nakatabang sa pagluto, sa pagbaligya sa puto cheese, banana chips, nga maoy makahatag sa panginahanglan sa akong pamilya. Through cooking and selling banana chips and rice cake, it helps to provide the needs of my family. So um, when she graduated from ICM's Transform program, she had developed a fair amount of hope, and she decided to embark on a lifelong dream. And so she decided to try to get her high school equivalency exam. So for the last 10 months, she's been in a class, and next week she will graduate from, uh, get her graduation from high school. So congratulations yeah. to that. So, uh, Maria, perhaps you can tell us uh, what has been one of the highlights of your time here in Hong Kong. Ang akong nanamian diri sa Hong Kong nga magsakay-sakay og train, elevator, ferryboat og escalator. The most I, the things I love here in Hong Kong that I I got a chance to ride in a ferry boat, in a train, escalator and elevator. <clears throat> she uh, told me that she was really surprised that we have 7-Elevens here in Hong Kong because she thought the 7-Eleven was just the local, the local store down at the end of the street for her. So, At any rate, listen, tonight our theme is Dream With Me. Can you, uh, Maria, tell me a little bit about your son, Melvin. What are his dreams? Ang akong anak si Melvin, buutan siya nga bata, mahilig siya mag-grab, mag-drawing, o... My son Melvin is a very good child. Uh, he loves to draw and rap, and his dream is to become a policeman. Listen, um, since, uh, since ICM's program, uh, Maria has been able to do more and more to try to make Melvin's dream become a reality. And, and at ICM, that's our goal. It is to equip parents to help their children make a better future. So, ladies and gentlemen, would you take a look at this video about Maria's son, Melvin.
Okay, now wait, just some man and stop and think. What's the fun? But if you can never realize it, never see it come to life. Every day you're pushed back to the bottom of the pile. And meanwhile, there's millions of people right beside you. So what do you do? Is there a way to rise above? Take a chance to use your hands and quit and mind to live up. Go higher than their expectations. Yo, fly. Start with education, yeah. Charing challenges of life, they get in the way and make you feel like there's no point of people trying. When someone comes beside you and opens up the lives and gives you hope, well, there's really no way to describe that what kids like me dream of in need of. I wish to speak to a son, tell us that there's someone who believes in us. So, so come, come and dream, dream with us, us and, and you will see we'll live a life worth living. living.